Ciao and welcome to Geo's Paintbrush, where 10 minutes is all it takes to be blown away by one of the world's greatest artists. In today's show, we'll consider Pablo Picasso's enigmatic gift to the city of Chicago, a 50-foot tall, 162-ton sculpture in steel that was unveiled in Daly Plaza during the City That Works lunch break on Tuesday, August 15, 1967. According to Time Out, just minutes before his honor, Mayor Richard J. Daly, pulled down the large blue drapery and unveiled the piece. Poet Gwendolyn Brooks, reading from an original work she prepared for the occasion, asked the crowd, Does man love art? Man visits art but squirms. Art hurts, as if she knew full well that Chi Town, an unabashedly direct, straightforward, give-it-to-me-straight city, a city that Elson Algren once said of, loving Chicago is like loving a woman with a broken nose, was probably not yet ready for Pablo Picasso's abstract, groundbreaking artistic vision. And Brooks was right. One alderman, according to Time Out, wanted to tear the sculpture down immediately and erect a statue of ball player Ernie Banks in its place. While old man Daly had been convinced that, even if he did not appreciate Picasso's art, a sculpture like this would help his city gain respect around the world, Chicagoans gathered for the dedication, clapped politely at first as the drapery hit the ground, but then stood in awkward silence. Some witnesses say a gasp went up from the crowd, all wondering, what the hell is that? To be honest, if I had not been just seven months old at the time, and I had been there at Daly Plaza on my lunch break in August of 67, I would have reacted in much the same way. Let's consider then this unlikely marriage, between the Spanish master, to me the greatest artist the world has seen since Michelangelo himself, and my hometown, fierce as a dog with tongue lapping for action, as Carl Sandburg once described it. How did our Picasso get here, and what is it supposed to be, and what can it possibly mean? Thanks for joining us. Now that's a question that amused Pablo Picasso. What does it mean? Time Out reported that when asked by a reporter back in France, what does the Chicago sculpture mean? The artist replied with a laugh, meanings, meanings, always petty meanings. But I learned long ago to separate the art from the artist, to let the work stand on their own two feet, in relationship to a complete body of artistic works, yes, but not to an artist's own wry commentary. So perhaps a little context can help in this instance. An architect called William Hartman of Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, the firm that designed the Civic Center, later renamed the Daly Center, convinced Picasso to contribute a design for a sculpture to adorn the building's plaza, and in 1965, Picasso donated a model, just three and a half feet tall, to be used by United States Steel in northwest Indiana to construct the full-size work. Picasso not only never visited Chicago to see the completed sculpture in person, when he died in April of 1973, he had never visited the U.S. Significantly, Picasso's untitled sculpture for Chicago's Municipal Plaza was one of the first large-scale public works of abstract art in the country. Imagine that, Chicago leading the way in cutting-edge public art. In terms of trying to get at what the work means, what essential truths it may reveal about us or about the world, we get no help from Picasso himself, no hints, no obviously realistic, easily identifiable forms or figures. In fact, we don't even get a title. But keep in mind that this apparent absence of meaning and apparent inaccessibility, two essential elements of understanding modern art, possess meaning in themselves. First, there is the typically modern notion of a failure of communication, the point that in a fast-paced, industrialized modern society, if human beings don't work at communication, at understanding one another, it will not happen. Ironically, despite all of the new technology and machines we've developed to improve communication and enrich our lives. Thus, in the modern world, accessing and deriving meaning from art requires work on the part of the viewer. The society for which the art is made must contribute something to the process, meet the artist halfway, because the whole point is that society is in danger of losing its ability to do so, in danger of losing its imagination, and perhaps even its will to connect in a meaningful way 
with themselves and others. As the poet William Carlos Williams said of his medium, poetry, it's hard to get the news from poems, and yet people die every day from a lack of what is found there. As Gwendolyn Brooks pointed out at the dedication of the Chicago sculpture 44 years ago, man visits art but squirms. Art hurts. Modern art gets us out of our comfort zone, requires us to think and listen differently, to see differently, with our expectations for instant recognition, clear, unambiguous meaning, expectations shaped by the pace of our time, our technology, our way of life, dashed by the artist, unless, that is, we're prepared to engage on a deeper level, to work at finding common ground for a dialogue with the art. And in the end, when we do engage in that dialogue, we may not always enjoy what the art has to tell us. The materials chosen by an artist with which to make a sculpture also lend inherent meaning. In this instance, we have a sculpture in steel on a stone base. I think it's wonderful that our Picasso was made at U.S. Steel in northwest Indiana, Gary to be exact, an unlikely collaboration between the Michelangelo of our time and the everyday hard-working men and women of northwest Indiana and Chicago's southeast side, around whom I grew up. My grandfather, in fact, worked in the mills for nearly four decades. It's my one personal connection to Pablo Picasso, and as tenuous as it may be, I'll take it. The way I look at it, my old neighborhood collaborated with Picasso, executing one of his designs as a gift to the greatest city in the world to be born after 1900, Chicago, Illinois. Let's consider the materials Picasso employed in the Chicago sculpture. Steel, an alloy comprised of iron and carbon, both naturally produced elements, is molded by human hands and machines invented, constructed, and operated by human hands. Nature manipulated and reconstituted to conform to human will, which, it seems to me, is a wonderfully apropos material for a Chicago sculpture. Chicago being a city formed amid a wild, swampy wilderness, a city nature sought to reclaim with the devastating fire of 1871, only to be reformed by human hands in a matter of months, using actual debris from the fire as landfill to expand the city eastward man always seeking to do nature one better, and the city that invented and perfected the modern skyscraper, using steel, strong but lightweight, nature's own ingredients, to defy gravity and claim the air and the sky as man's domain. In addition to the larger context of modern art, and the materials Picasso selected for the sculpture, we should also consider the piece in relation to the artist's enormous body of work over a career that spanned seven decades. While I personally try to resist the temptation to find a single concrete answer to the question, what is it supposed to be, to the extent that it reveals one possible interpretation of the sculpture, I think it's a valid question to explore. In three words, I think a naturalistic interpretation of Chicago's Picasso leads to this conclusion. It's a woman. Even a cursory glance at other works by Picasso, Paintings and drawings that clearly explore female forms and character reveal striking similarities between these works and the Chicago sculpture. Some art historians have noted that the work specifically resembles portrayals of Picasso's second and last wife, Jacqueline. I, however, don't see the value in getting that specific. But when I consider the piece on its own merits, simply seeking to identify what the lines and shapes suggest to me, I do indeed subscribe to the notion of the sculpture as a female form. For example, observe the skirt-shaped plate, bottom center, the fullness suggesting a discrete life-giving force, a strength, leading up to an exaggeratedly narrow waist, small breasts, elongated neck, a nod perhaps to a Spanish master from another time, El Greco, and long flowing hair that drops from a misshapen head, parted in the center, flowing down below her waist. The curves, the lines, the scale, the bold pose, the entire composition suggests a sort of powerful, natural, and solid femininity. But even if one accepts the generally acknowledged interpretation of the work as a woman, other interpretations include Picasso's dog or a large bird, one important question remains. Why wouldn't an artist of Picasso's skill present a woman that, you know, looks like a woman? To understand why Picasso's Chicago sculpture isn't easily recognized as a female figure, or anything that one can identify readily for that matter, 
one has to first consider what Picasso sought to accomplish in his art. Early in his career, Picasso was a naturalistic painter, vividly recreating scenes from life with a skill that was extraordinary in someone so young. Soon, however, following explorations of how various colors could be employed uniquely to redefine truth in painting and communicate emotion and feeling, his blue and red periods, the artist, who seemingly could do anything, set his sights even higher. He sought to transform painting and sculpture through an approach that came to be known as Cubism. Cubism was Picasso's original method of portraying in a single work of art multiple perspectives on the same subject by deconstructing the subject into sections or cubes, with each offering the viewer a different point of view, an approach that not only allowed for greater complexity in exploring a subject, but also demonstrated how crucial one's perspective is in experiencing art and life. With this unique groundbreaking approach, rather than considering Mona Lisa's famous enigmatic smile from the one perspective Leonardo gave us, for example, we could, if Picasso had painted the same subject, experience Mona Lisa from a variety of angles and points of view at once, in essence, achieving multiple dimensions on canvas. But let's return to the Chicago sculpture as a woman. According to Christina Arriero of Princeton University, Picasso's portrayal of women and sexuality in his art was controversial, with critics taking offense at what they considered to be the artist's objectification of women portraying them as exclusively interested in fulfilling the sexual desires of men. Our Euro suggests that Picasso, over time, began to depersonalize women in his art as a result of this criticism, so they could not be identified as real women he knew. Picasso had countless mistresses in his lifetime, and some even suggest he used them for a type of erotic inspiration, and when he no longer felt inspired by a woman, he moved on to another one. The Chicago sculpture, note the face for example, certainly demonstrates this approach, this attempt to strip a subject of personal identity with no possible means of identifying the woman portrayed, or in fact even stating with certainty that the face, one aspect of an impersonal exploration of a female form and essence, is even a face. And perhaps this ambiguity reflected more than Picasso's attempt to shield himself from criticism for his obsession artistically and personally with women and sexuality. To me, the Chicago sculpture possesses a strength, but also a remarkable lightness of being, a more human scale than the surrounding structures, and an aspirational quality suggested by the hair and the thin rods helping support the hair and the upward gaze of the face. I think it's this aspirational quality of the work that, along with some elements of the composition, look at the hair as wings, for instance, and the narrowness of the neck, that leads some to suggest the subject here is really a bird. The 85-year-old artist did not create something entirely new for Chicago, but instead combined a variety of concepts and artistic fragments that span nearly a century for his model for the Chicago sculpture. The model, by the way, is now part of the permanent collection of the Art Institute of Chicago. While I've now spent the better part of a month considering whether any significance can be attributed to Picasso's donation of a female form to Chicago. For instance, was this a conscious choice on his part, influenced by what he knew of the city or the plaza or the building? I still can't even hazard a guess. It's just as possible that our Picasso is simply what the artist had on hand and on his mind at the time, since women were so prevalent in his work over many, many years. And I think that's a great place to end this show, with some ambiguity and lots of work left to do for you and for me to truly understand the relationship between this one-of-a-kind, beautiful sculpture. I'm reminded again of Algren's notion that loving Chicago is like loving a woman with a broken nose and this remarkable city. If you have a thought, don't hesitate to leave a comment on my channel. Grazie mille e ciao. Oh, it's so picturesque Does it haunt me?